People hear me? Yeah, it's okay. It's just, it just sounds a wee bit funny to me, but maybe it's my hearing. Um, we're here to worship God, and in Psalm 105, it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let's give thanks to the Lord uh, together by standing to sing part of Psalm 31. In you I've taken refuge, Lord.
is going to come now and lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come this morning and worship you. We thank you that we can come in such freedom, and we pray we'll never forget the freedom we have to come and open your word and share with each other and share with the community we're in. Lord, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through your word, and Lord, we have this freedom to read it. Lord, we thank you for your provision for us. We thank you how you give us all that we need and more, and how you're with us and providing for us each and every day. Lord, we thank you that you are so, so good to us. Lord, we turn and ask for forgiveness for the times that we sin against you and do wrong against you. We thank you that you forgive us, and we pray that when we live for ourselves, live to glorify ourselves and put ourselves above you, Lord, you will forgive us for that. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and thank you that we, you are a forgiving God who loves us so much. Lord, we pray this week ahead you will give us strength to fight against sin and live for you. Lord, we thank you that you are always with us and your spirit is with us to help us and we pray that he will guide us this week. Lord, give us strength to stand for you and remember the opportunity and witnesses we are and the lights we are, wherever we are, Lord. We pray there will be opportunities to reflect you and speak of you each and every day. And Lord, we pray for this morning as we open your word, it will equip and prepare us for this week ahead to live and shine for you. Amen. Having confessed our sins, hear the good news from Jeremiah 33, where it says, or God promises, I will cleanse them from all the guilt of their sin against me, and I will forgive all the guilt of their sin and rebellion against me. Thanks be to God for his uh, kindness to us. So, again, I've got some uh, pictures for the, the boys and girls and for uh, everyone else, of course, uh, you can look on as well. Uh, I hope no one's uh, frightened of uh, creepy crawlies because they've got a few creepy crawlies. Uh, first of all, ladybird. I don't think anybody's afraid of ladybirds, are they? Uh, you see ladybirds in, in the garden, and uh, often you like to sort of uh, get them to crawl over your finger uh, because uh, they're, they're red, they're, they're black, they're cute, and uh, people like them, and then, of course, they, they can fly off. Uh, so there's a, a ladybird. That's okay, isn't it? Um, then after that, what have we got? Uh, we've got, do you know what this is? This is, uh, this is an ant, uh, so an ant um, that you'll maybe find in the garden, uh, or sometimes so often when you go on holiday, you have lots of ants. I remember being on holiday and uh, the ants came into the apartment, it was a sunny place, and they found some sugar and they climbed up onto the table and uh, were eating the sugar in the sugar bowl. Uh, lots and lots of ants, and maybe you'll see them uh, around the garden, very, very small of course, and uh, usually you see lots of them, and they can be a wee bit nasty because they can nip you, can't they? And uh, it's a wee bit sore if they nip you. So what else do we have? Uh, do you know what this is? Uh, now, when I was growing up, I called this a slater, but it's a, it's a wood louse. Uh, and so if you're in the garden and maybe there's a, a brick or maybe there's a bit of uh, wood that's been lying there for a long time, you pick it up and you'll find lots of these wood, wood louse uh, crawling around underneath. Uh, you'll get lots and lots of them, and uh, they're a wee bit unpleasant, really, when you see them, uh, so don't go too near them. So those are the, the wood uh, lice, or lice, maybe. Uh, what about this one? Uh, it's, it's a worm, of course, uh, so it looks a bit disgusting, doesn't it? You know, uh, a sort of a wet, slimy uh, a worm that you'd see in the ground. Uh, they uh, sometimes pop up from the soil or the, uh, the, the grass, and you can see them. But again, they're not very pleasant. Uh, what else do we have? Okay, do you know what this is? Uh, the boys and girls, maybe your, your parents, if your par parents are keen gardeners, you might hear them complaining about this. It's green fly, uh, green fly, and uh, they're a bit nasty because they, they will uh, eat your, your plants, and so people don't like them, and they try and uh, kill them maybe with some um, uh, poison or something like that. They'll spray their plants to kill the green fly, otherwise they'll, they'll eat the, the plants. So that's a green fly. And I think that maybe then, what are we, oh yeah, this is the one I'm getting to. This has all been leading up to this one. Do you know what this is? This is, uh, this is the locust, or it looks a wee bit like a grasshopper. I'm not sure what the difference between a, a grasshopper and a locust is. But this is a, a locust, 
And uh, that's what we're thinking about today. And uh, locusts, well, we're not bothered by locusts in our country, but other countries around the world, they're bothered by them, not just by one, because they're very small, but you don't usually just get one locust. You get thousands or even millions of uh, locusts in a big swarm. And uh, I was reading about one, and uh, it said, the swarm of locusts was 37 miles long and 25 miles wide, not meters, but miles, this huge swarm of locusts, thousands and thousands, millions and millions of them. And the problem with the locusts, apart from the fact that they swarm in such big groups, is they just eat everything in their path. And so maybe there's a farmer and he's planted his crops and the crops are growing in the field and he's going to use those crops to, uh, to uh, sell and make money so he can pay his bills and keep living. And uh, this swarm of locusts come along and they just eat everything in the field all at once. And they'll eat everything in the ne next fields and the next town. They'll go all over the place. They'll go into houses. They'll go into your bed. Uh, and they eat not just food, but they'll eat the clothes. Somebody said they eat the clothes in your back. And uh, they'll eat leather. And uh, they'll eat really anything that they can eat. And so uh, it's very serious when there's a, a, a swarm of locusts because they destroy everything. And uh, I was reading somebody said about how they could hear the sound of a million jaw, jaws munching. So they're munching away in the food, all of these locusts, and you can hear the noise of it. And uh, it's uh, very frightening when it happens, very worrying when it happens. Fortunately, it doesn't happen here. So, uh, oh, I've got another picture of locusts. Yes, there you are. So there's uh, in a country, uh, this is in uh, Africa somewhere, and you can see the, 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 the air is thick with these uh, locusts. You can hardly see the people because of all the locusts flying around. And then one last picture, they're all lying in the ground. So you can imagine, as far as you can see, the, the ground is thick, again, with these uh, locusts, nasty creatures. Why am I telling you about locusts? Uh, well, we're going through the books of the Bible, and today we've got to the book of Joel. Again, he was one of the Lord's prophets, uh, so it was his job to declare God's word to God's people in Old Testament times. And we don't know anything about Joel. Uh, we don't really know when he was uh, working, when he was preaching. But in the book of Joel, it tells us about a swarm of locusts that had come on the land. And it describes what they did is, if you think of the Garden of Eden, do you remember the Garden of Eden in the beginning? Everything was perfect. And uh, Adam and Eve were able to walk through the garden and they're full of plants, full of flowers, full of vegetables, full of fruit. Everything was uh, beautiful to look at and good to eat. And uh, Joel says how the land was like the Garden of Eden. So everything, was f the, the fields were full of, uh, of plants and vegetables and fruit. Everything that people could possibly want. And then the, sw the swarm of locusts came by and everything looked like a desert. Because everything had been de eaten or everything was dead. And so Joel talks about this. A swarm of locusts that had come on the land and uh, people of course were very upset by it and then Joel said to the people well you know uh, unless you repent in other words unless you turn back to God give up your sins and turn back to God something even worse is going to happen to you so you think the swarm of locusts was bad well something even worse is going to happen unless you turn back to God and start to obey him and worship him the way that you should. And so the book of Joel reminds us that God is, he's holy. We talk about God being holy because he hates sin and uh, he punishes sinners for all that we've done wrong. But Joel also reminds us that God is, is gracious and good because he says to his people, come back to me, come back to me. Uh, maybe you see people, boys and girls, maybe you see somebody in school that you're maybe afraid of. Maybe there's a teacher or the headmaster and you're a wee bit scared of them. Or maybe, you know, you see a policeman or something, you're a wee bit nervous of them. Well, uh, God says, come back to me and you don't need to be uh, worried because I'm full of love and I'm willing to forgive you all that you've done wrong. So come back to me. And then 
God also said to the people through the prophet Joel, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So disaster is going to come, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And what he means is we're meant to call on the Lord God. That's what uh, all of us are to do. Uh, from the youngest to the oldest here today, we're to call on God and say to him, we know that we've done wrong. Will you forgive us for the sake of Jesus who died for us? And he took the blame for all that we have done wrong. And will you forgive us and give us eternal life? Uh, so we're to call on the name of the Lord, saying we're sorry for our sins, trusting in Jesus for forgiveness. And it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So instead of disaster coming upon us because of all the bad things that we've done, God promises us eternal life in his presence. And so that's a book of uh, Joel, by the swarm of locusts. And uh, Joel said, well, now turn back to God or something worse will happen. And he said, if you turn to God, you'll discover how he's willing to forgive you all that you've done wrong. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the book of Joel, this reminder that you're holy and you hate sin, but this reminder too that you're full of love and you're willing to forgive everyone who calls on you and trusts in your son, Jesus Christ. So will you help us all from the very youngest to the very oldest to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation? And we pray too that you'll Watch over the boys and girls and everything they do this coming week, whether they're at home or in play school or in school. Help them, Lord God, in all that they do. Keep them all safe and well. And we pray this in our Savior's name. Amen. Well, the boys and girls can go out now to uh, Children's Church. Uh, And uh, Derek's going to come now and read to us from uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, commencing at verse 1. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Saviour, and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. 
I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them you might fight the battle well, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, who am, who, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Amen. Let's pray for a moment. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're uh, beginning a, a new series of sermons uh, this morning. As I say, we're, we're starting a new series of sermons uh, this evening as well, but uh, also in this morning. And uh, we're going through, hopefully, the plan is that the pastoral letters, uh, the pastoral letters uh, comprise uh, Paul's first and second letter to Timothy, and then his letter to Titus. Uh, all three of these letters are fairly short, uh, so we might go through all three of them, uh, one after the other, or uh, who knows, I might take a break before we get to the end. We'll just have to see how we get on. The pastoral letters uh, there are different from Paul's other letters, because whereas his other letters were written to churches, uh, so to the church in Rome, to the church in Ephesus, uh, to the church in Gal or the churches in Galatia, um, uh, the pastoral letters they are written to single people, uh, to Timothy who was in Ephesus and to Titus who was in Crete. Uh, from verse three of uh, one Timothy one, you'll see that Paul left Timothy in Ti sorry in Ephesus to oversee the work there while Paul moved on to Macedonia. And from verse 5 of Titus 1, you'll see that Paul left Titus in Crete to oversee the work on that island. Uh, this, of course, all happened uh, after the end of the book of Acts. Uh, so the book of Acts ends with uh, Paul in prison in Rome. However, he was later released and he was able to continue his itinerant ministry going from place to place to plant new churches and to strengthen churches he had already planted. And uh, it seems that he took Timothy and Titus with him. But he left Titus in Crete and he left Timothy in Ephesus. And now uh, Paul is writing to them uh, to instruct them on what they're to do, uh, what they're to teach, and he wants to encourage them in their work as they minister to God's people. In terms of uh, background, you can read about Timothy in Acts 16, where we're told that he was already a disciple uh, when Paul first met him. Uh, his father was a, a Greek. Uh, his mother, a Jewish mother, she was a believer. And uh, the other believers who knew him spoke well of him to Paul. And so Paul decided to take him along with him on his missionary journeys. And uh, his name appears in most of Paul's other letters as one of his co-workers in the ministry. Titus doesn't appear in the book of Acts, but his name pops up in, in Paul's letters, again, as one of his co-workers. So as we turn now to the uh, first chapter, you'll see that it opens in a, in a similar way to uh, Paul's letters. 
Uh, first, Paul introduces himself. This is what he always does. This was the custom when people wrote letters in those days. And he introduces himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. So an apostle, of course, was someone who had seen the risen Lord Jesus and who had been appointed by the Lord to be uh, an official eyewitness of the resurrection. And Paul had seen the risen Lord Jesus when the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus and appointed him to be an apostle. Paul refers to God the Father as our Savior because he saves his people from the coming wrath by his Son. And he refers to the Lord Jesus as our hope because through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive the hope of the resurrection and everlasting life in God's presence. And then Paul addresses the recipient of the letter, who is Timothy, my true son in the faith. And that speaks to us of Paul's affection for Timothy, because he loves Timothy just as a father loves his son. But of course, in those days, a son was often his father's apprentice in the family business. And uh, Timothy has been learning from Paul about what it means to be a minister of the gospel. And then uh, Paul greets Timothy with the words, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So what does uh, Timothy need from the Lord? What do you and I need from the Lord every day? Well, we need grace, mercy, and peace. We need his grace because we're sinners. We need his mercy because of our misery and our weakness. And because God is gracious and merciful, willing to pardon our sins, willing to help us every day, then we have peace. That sense that all will be well. All will be well because we can trust in God our Father to work all things together for our good. So that's the opening of the letter. And then we come to the remainder of the chapter. And I think we need to take the, the remainder of the chapter together. Other preachers tend to divide it up into different sections. But I think we need to take it together because the rest of the chapter belongs together, as I hope you'll see. Uh, so in verse 3, Paul uh, refers to the time when he was leaving Ephesus to go to Macedonia. And he wanted Timothy to remain behind in Ephesus. And he wanted Timothy to remain behind in order to command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and uh, endless genealogies which only promote controversies. Well, last uh, Sunday evening, we finished uh, a series of sermons on 2 Corinthians in which uh, Paul was warning the believers in Corinth about false teachers who were preaching a false gospel. So in Corinth, there was trouble in the church because of false teaching. And here in Ephesus, there was trouble in the church because of false teaching. Ever since the serpent deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden, the devil has been trying to confuse God's people and to lead us astray through false teachers and through false doctrine. So sometimes people complain that uh, doctrine is, uh, is dry and boring and why do we need to bother with doctrine? Because it's so hard to understand. But we need to know uh, what the true doctrine is about God and about our salvation. Otherwise, we'll be taken in by false teachers and by false doctrine. And there's plenty of it around the world. We don't really know what the uh, false teachers in Ephesus were teaching, but since Paul refers to myths and genealogies, uh, some commentators think that they used myths and legends and made up stories about people whose names appear in the Old Testament genealogies, you know, the list of names that you find there from time to time. And when Paul uh, refers to endless genealogies, he might be saying that the false teachers were just going on and on and on and on about these things. But what they're teaching doesn't promote the peace and well-being of the church because their false doctrine only leads to controversy. 
You see that in verse 4 if you've got your Bible open. And then if you jump down to verse 6, uh, you'll see that Paul refers to meaningless talk. Meaningless talk. So that's what he thinks of what they were saying. And of course, uh, we still come across this kind of thing, uh, don't we? Every few years, uh, there'll be some new book in which the author claims to be an expert in the Bible, and the author has discovered some new teaching, some new insight, which uh, no one else has ever discovered before, but now this author wants to reveal it to the world. Uh, or the author will apply the Bible in a, in a whole new way. He'll think of some kind of application which no one has ever thought of before. So I was listening to another preacher who was preaching on this passage, and he reminded me of uh, the book, The Prayer of Jabez. Uh, do you remember that? Uh, it was uh, published a few years ago. This is what Amazon says about that book, which was as I say, published a few years ago, Amazon says, the life of Jabez, one of the Bible's most overlooked heroes of the faith, bursts from unbroken pages of genealogies in an, in an audacious four-part prayer that brings him an extraordinary measure of divine favor, anointing, and protection. It's not interesting. It refers to genealogies and to an overlooked, obscure person from the Old Testament, and the author has learned this secret which he wants to teach you if you'll only buy his book. Uh, this preacher I was listening to also mentioned uh, the, uh, a book that he saw once about dieting in God's way uh, and uh, books about secret codes that are hidden in the scriptures and yet the authors manage to discover them and can explain them. And so well, this happens in every generation and it was happening in Ephesus in the days of Paul and Timothy. And Paul says in verse 7 that these false teachers wanted to be uh, teachers of the law. So that was their, their expertise. Uh, that was their area of interest. And uh, that's what they majored on. Uh, but look at verse 7. Paul says, Paul says, they don't know what they're talking about. They want to be experts in the law, but they don't know what they're talking about. They come across as confident, uh, self-assured teachers, but they don't know what they're talking about. And Paul goes on to explain uh, that the law is good uh, if one uses it properly. And of course, that suggests, doesn't it, that the false preachers were not using it properly. So how should the law of God be used? Well, Paul explains that it's not for the righteous. That is, it's not for believers. So who's it for? Well, Paul tells us it's for lawbreakers and rebels, those who break God's law and rebel against his rule over us. And lawbreakers and rebels are further described as the ungodly and sinful, uh, the unholy and irreligious, those who kill their parents, murderers, uh, adulterers, and well, my version uh, of the Bible says perverts, but uh, Derek uh, read it right, his translation is correct. Men who practice homosexuality, it should be. Slave traders, liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, uh, Paul adds at the end. Uh, some of the commentators think Paul's list echoes most of the Ten Commandments. So uh, killing parents is uh, obviously a violation of the fifth commandment. Murder is a violation of the sixth commandment. Adultery and homosexuality are violations of the seventh commandment. Slave traders or uh, people stealers, it's sometimes translated, they, they're breaking the eighth commandment because they're stealing people. Lying and perjury violate the ninth commandment. And uh, given those connections with the 10 commandments, which are fairly obvious, then it's possible that the unholy violate the third commandment by not keeping God's name holy, and perhaps the irreligious violate the fourth commandment by not keeping the Sabbath day holy. So then that's uh, commandments three to nine. And what Paul is saying is that the law is for lawbreakers and rebels because the law is able to convict them of their sin and of their need of a savior. And that's one of the purposes of the law. God's law reveals to unbelievers their sin and corruption so that they will repent and believe the good news of salvation. 
Now, of course, God's law is also useful for believers because it reveals to us the will of the Lord and how to glorify God in our daily lives. And so for believers who love the Lord and who want to please him, the law is a useful guide to show us what he wants us to do each day. But when Paul says here it's for lawbreakers and rebels, he means it's useful for unbelievers because God uses his law to convict them of their sin so that they'll repent and believe. So that's what the law is for. And when it's used in the right way, it's good and it's useful. But when it's used in the wrong way, it's harmful to the church. And from what, from what Paul says here, the false teachers were using the law in the wrong way. And so when the Christians in Ephesus gathered in church on Sundays, what did they hear from these false teachers? Did they hear the message of Christ? Did they hear the message of the cross? Did they hear of grace and mercy and peace from God? Did they hear about faith and forgiveness? Well, no, it seems that all they heard from the false teachers, these experts in the law, was the law. Law, law, and more law. Do this, do that, don't do that, do this. That's all they heard from these experts in the law. And you see, as another preacher uh, puts it, the issue was this, the issue was this, do you want a law-based church or a gospel-based church? Do you want a church where the emphasis is on the law and on keeping the law and on all the things you have to do for God? Or do you want a church where the emphasis is on the gospel and on what God has done for us by his son? When you come to church on Sundays, what do you need to hear most of all? The law alone and a list of things you have to do? Or do you want to hear the gospel and to be reminded all over again that your sins have been pardoned? because of Christ who died for you, so that despite your sins and your shortcomings, you have peace with God. Do you know what's wrong with a law-based uh, church and a law-based uh, message? Tim Keller, an American minister, he's very good at explaining this. He says it either leads to pride or it leads to despair. A law-based uh, message leads either to pride or to despair. It leads to pride because uh, we're pleased with ourselves because of all the things that we have done right. So think of the, the parable of the Pharisee who went to the temple to pray, but uh, in his prayer, uh, what did he do? Well, he boasted about his righteousness. And we can become proud because we're pleased with ourselves because of all that we have done. And uh, then we despise the people around us because they're not as good or as righteous as we are. And so we can be uh, proud and uh, then we start to criticize the people around us. And we find fault with them because they're not as good as the rest of us. I've kept the law. I've done what I'm supposed to do. Whereas all those other people, they break the law all of the time. And so a law-based message uh, leads to pride, or it can lead to despair. It leads to despair because if I believe that I have to climb up to God by my own good deeds, then I'm never too sure whether I've done enough. And when I sin, as I surely will because I'm a sinner, then that means I've fallen further away from God rather than come closer to him. And so it leads to despair because I know I'm not good enough and I don't think I've done enough. And therefore there's no hope for me if my salvation depends upon me and my good deeds. That's what a law-based church and a law-based message leads to. It either leads to pride or it leads to despair. And so it's a little wonder that Paul urges Timothy to command the false teachers to stop what they're doing. And instead of having a law-based church with a law-based message, we want a gospel-based church and a gospel-based message. 
And so, so Paul goes on to write about the gospel in verses 12 to 17. And his explanation of the gospel begins with thanksgiving. It begins with thanksgiving because whereas the law is about what I must do for God, the gospel is about what he has done for me. And it's about the salvation I receive from faith, through faith. And so Paul gives thanks to the Lord uh, who appointed Paul to his service and who has uh, given Paul the strength he needed uh, to serve the Lord. And of course, you know the story, don't you? Uh, Paul, who was known as Saul in, uh, in those, those days, uh, he was on the road to Damascus because he was going there to arrest the Christians in that city. Uh, but then on the way, the risen and exalted Lord Jesus appeared to him and his life was changed. Uh, Saul, the great persecutor of the faith, became Paul, the great preacher of the faith. And this was such a gracious thing for Christ to do for Paul because Paul knew now that he was a sinner in those days who deserved nothing but condemnation and wrath. He says in verse 13 that he was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, or perhaps it's, it should be proud man or insolent man. Uh, so he was once very proud of himself and his own righteousness. And he used to persecute the church of Jesus Christ. And he was a blas blasphemer because he once despised the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he once was, but he was shown mercy. The Lord was prepared to forgive him for all that he had done wrong when he was ignorant about the truth about Jesus Christ. And when he was still an unbeliever. And though he deserved to be condemned and punished for his wickedness, the grace of the Lord Jesus was poured out upon him abundantly. So he's, uh, he's conveying to us the sheer abundance, the superabundance of Christ's kindness to him. What he deserved was for God's wrath to be poured out upon him. But instead, Christ's kindness was poured out upon him. And from Christ the Lord, he received faith and love so that he was enabled to trust in Christ the Savior. And he was filled with love for Christ and love for Christ's people. And then he gets uh, to the, the gospel message in verse 15, which is the good news of what God has done for sinners like Paul, by his son, Jesus Christ. And so here it is, the gospel message in a nutshell. Christ Jesus came into the world. Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? To teach us the law, to uh, tell us about all the things that we have to do in order to climb up to God. No, he came into the world to save sinners. So the eternal son of God came into the world as one of us, in order to suffer and to die on the cross for sinners, paying for our sins with his life, shedding his blood to cleanse us from our guilt before rising again to give us eternal life. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst, Paul adds. And uh, notice, notice that he didn't say, I was the worst. He said, I am the worst. Paul still regarded himself as a sinner because that's what we always wear and that's what we will always be until we're glorified in Christ's presence in the life to come. But in this life, in this life, you're either a sinner who is under condemnation from God because you haven't yet believed or else you're a sinner who has received mercy from God through faith in his Son. And to encourage us all to trust in Christ for salvation, Paul uh, presents what happened to him as an example for others. So look at verse 16. He says, I received mercy and Christ was patient with me as an example for those who would believe. And so we know that Christ put up, puts up with our sin and our, belief, our unbelief in order to give us time to repent and whoever repents, turning from their life of sin and unbelief, 
Whoever turns with faith to Christ the Savior receives mercy from God, the forgiveness of their sins, and the hope of eternal life. And since the gospel is all about God and what he has done for sinners to save us, then God receives all the honor and all the glory. A law-based message leads to pride so that we boast in ourselves and not in God. Or a law-based message leads to despair so that we have nothing to boast about. But a gospel-based message leads to boasting about God. And so Paul writes in verse 17, To the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. God's the eternal king because he is without beginning and without end. He's immortal in the sense that he is incorruptible. He doesn't decay or perish or diminish over time. He's invisible because he's a spirit. And he's the only God because whatever other gods are worshipped are only idols who can do nothing. But he's the only God who made us, who sustains us, and who saves us by his son. And he deserves the honor and the glory because of what he has done for sinners. And so when we come to a, a gospel-based church and when we believe the gospel-based message and trust in Christ to save us from the condemnation we deserve, then we'll want to give thanks to the Lord God. And so says Paul at the end, I've given you this instruction, Timothy. I've given you this instruction. I've instructed you to command the false teachers to stop teaching their law-based message. And he reminds Timothy that as a minister of the gospel, he must fight the good fight, which means he must defend the gospel in the face of unbelief and opposition. Fight the good fight by holding on to faith and to a good conscience. So Paul, uh, Timothy's to watch what he believes and he's to watch what he does. Because if he stops believing or if he ends up with a guilty conscience because of something he's done wrong, then he'll become like these two men mentioned here who were among those who shipwrecked their faith. So keep believing, Timothy. Keep your conscience uh, clear, clean and clear and defend the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And so when you come to church, uh, you'll hear the gospel. You'll hear the gospel. You'll also hear the law because those who believe the, the gospel uh, want to obey the law out of gratitude to God for all that he has done for us. But the law must never take over. The law must never take over and the gospel message must always take precedence because by hearing and believing the gospel, you're saved from condemnation and you receive eternal life. And by hearing and believing the gospel, you'll be kept from pride because you'll, you'll see that you're only a sinner saved by grace. And you'll be kept from despair because you'll see that God is able to save even the worst sinner by his son. And no matter what you have done wrong in this life, no matter uh, how large your sins are or how many they are, your sin is covered over with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by hearing and believing the gospel, you'll be filled with love and praise to God who sent his son into the world to save you, to save you. This is not a message for other people. Sometimes we think, you know, this is so-and-so needs to hear this message. This is a message for you personally, because whoever believes the gospel of Jesus Christ can say that God sent his son into the world to save me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ and how you sent your Son into the world to save sinners. And Lord God, each one of us is a sinner. Lord, will you help us therefore to trust in the son, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that we might receive salvation, the forgiveness of our sins, and the hope of everlasting life in your presence. 
And Lord God, will you fill us with, with love and praise for you so that every day we'll want to give thanks to you and praise you for your grace and your mercy in Christ Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's uh, stand to sing our closing hymn, which is uh, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. in the name of the Lord this is God's charge we should believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he has commanded us the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all amen